And here you are. Welcome to the second lecture by Pratik Shaudhari on uh, the principles of uh, deep learning. Thank you, Pratik. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, nice to see you again. Uh, today, uh, we will uh, take off from where we left yesterday uh, uh, and we began to introduce neural architectures. And today we are going to look uh, a little bit deeper into how, what kind of operations uh, typical neural networks have. Okay. Uh, if I can finish scrolling up, uh, yes. So to refresh your memory, uh, we, we, we said at the beginning of uh, yesterday's lecture that uh, uh, a two layer neural network uh, looks like this. It has a S, which will use to denote the weights of the first layer, W, which will use to denote the weights of the second layer. And uh, it's, it's a function, which is some nonlinear operation, uh, which I denote by sigma here, uh, of S transpose X. Uh, S is a matrix, X is a vector. Uh, let's say if X is a vector in uh, D dimensions, and S is a matrix in D cross P dimensions, then this entire thing is a vector in p dimensions okay and sigma acts uh, element wise on this entire vector uh, and returns us uh, a, a vector of the nonlinear function applied to every one of its elements uh, now this function we would like to think of as a, a classifier uh, built using two weights w and s and they both interact in non-trivial ways so if we did not learn any features, if we simply had X here, then this would be an easy problem. It would be a linear model and we would be fitting a convex optimization problem while fitting it on the training data set. But then uh, because you have W and S that interact multiplicatively so, uh, if sigma is not equal to identity, then uh, we have it, uh, in our hands a slightly harder problem. Uh, it is a non-convex optimization problem. And so in, in, in this lecture, we'll look at a few techniques to solve uh, non-convex optimization problems or understand uh, the problems that are uh, typically seen in deep learning. Uh, and there is really like a, a one big thing to appreciate from this entire construction. We began with a linear model, uh, but then uh, we said, look, if you want to build a linear model, you can uh, use a feature space construction, throw your features, uh, throw your inputs out into a larger feature space and create more complicated nonlinear functions. Uh, if you did so, you would have to choose a value of phi. You would have to choose your features. This is what uh, people used to do 10 years ago when they say you get an image. Uh, let's say this image could look uh, like the digit five. Uh, what features of this image should I use to classify the five as a five? Uh, and how will I make sure that the features of the five are distinct from the features of six? Uh, the same question applies to uh, uh, words that you can type. So this is the first letter of my word in, in my native language. And you can say that uh, there is some other word, let's say, I don't know how to write Chinese, but I'll try uh, in this very horrible way. Uh, and this could be some other character. Uh, if you wanted to build a machine that can recognize images or then read images, uh, you would have to featureize uh, these images yourself. And because the space of problems is quite large, the space of features that you can construct for these problems is also very large. Uh, and it's really very difficult to come up with good features. Uh, the, the idea behind deep learning or the reason why people find it so attractive is that you don't have to choose the features yourself. Uh, when you fit this model on the data set, both W, the classifier, and S, the matrix that creates the features, this is a particular kind of feature that we are creating, uh, are chosen by the optimization procedure. You can expect these features to be well-tuned to the kind of data that you have at your hands and not, uh, uh, not, not too uh, fluid in some sense. And uh, people have noticed that the features are also nice like this, okay? And that is why deep networks, roughly speaking, are so attractive or so powerful uh, in the eyes of many people. Uh, what we saw above, uh, I have re replaced the classifier with weights V, uh, just because I want to use W for something else later. Uh, this is a two-layer neural network. I call it two layers because it, it has two different weights, S and V. 
and then there is one nonlinearity that sits in between it. Okay. Uh, you can do the same thing and create a multi layer uh, neural network, multi layer uh, deep uh, neural network uh, by having the features being composed many, many times. And this is uh, powerful because it is an ability to take old features and compose them uh, or take linear combinations precisely in this case uh, in different ways uh, before you hand them off to the classifier to use. Of course, if we complained about this problem being difficult to solve uh, or optimizing this function being difficult to solve, then this one is even harder because it has L different layers that create the uh, features and the last classifier layer. So it has many, many more parameters to fit. Uh, it is a large problem. It is a high dimensional problem uh, because the total number of features, the total number of unknown parameters that you're searching for using your training samples is large. You know that uh, if you want to pinch down a function in high dimensions, then you need exponentially many samples in the dimensionality of the function. So you should expect fitting such functions to be much harder than fitting the perceptron. Okay, so uh, the but, but the ba basic theme of the uh, uh, construction, uh, basic theme of the problem doesn't change. We are still after finding the best parameters uh, that minimize the loss. You can also use a hinge loss in this case. If the uh, true outputs uh, are binary, uh, so the lie, let's say between uh, minus one and one, the set, uh, your out, the predicted out, output of the model after you apply a sign function to whatever comes out from your neural network, that will also be plus one or minus one. And uh, that is why you can use the hinge loss. Okay. So this is the optimization objective uh, for a binary classifier built using a deep neural network. Uh, and when people build such models, uh, they notice that the features seem meaningful. Yeah. So the features S that people uh, people found. So they will take S transpose X, and then they'll apply the nonlinearity, and let's say the first S transpose X. And these visualizations are uh, uh, um, constructed by feeding in many different Xs uh, to uh, the uh, um, um, network or alternatively looking at uh, S directly, uh, R, which is some, in some sense the average feature uh, that uh, you have seen through your entire data set. Okay? And you will notice that the first layers features, they look a little bit like uh, edges, uh, colors, different kinds of colors, etc. And people in computer vision uh, will know them as Gabor filters. Gabor filters are uh, filters that uh, look like ellipses with different angles uh, and the uh, variance of the ellipse is large or the angle of the ellipse is large and that is what allows you to detect uh, different kinds of edges in, uh, in images. As you can appreciate, the features uh, of this kind, they are not very specific to the data set that you're using. Uh, this particular uh, picture was created using features of a data set called ImageNet, which we talked last time. It is a data set of uh, images, uh, about a million images uh, of many different objects. Uh, and those tend to have colors, those tend to have edges, don't tend to have low level texture. And that is indeed what these features seem to pick. Okay? If I were to give you a slightly different data set, let us say all the photos on your phone right now, the features that you would learn uh, in the first layer wouldn't be too different because the world is quite similar at that scale and you don't you you will not um, bother to learn different features because you have many more layers at the top to learn more specialized features to your task okay uh, as you go up in the layer you see uh, slightly more complicated features emerging so uh, remember that our second layer is at the end of the day something that takes in linear, linear combinations of the old features uh, using this matrix S2. This matrix S2 is also learned and then applies a nonlinearity. And so it is going to take these edges and take linear combinations of all the uh, features in this part and then apply some nonlinear function to them uh, element-wise, okay? Uh, they often tend to look a little bit like this. And here you can notice certain patterns uh, that are appearing already. Uh, you might notice this to be either an eye or a football, who knows, uh, uh, and, and you can sit and interpret such kinds of patterns. 
Okay. Uh, if you go even higher up in the layers of a network, you will see even more distinctive patterns. Now you can even see objects. Uh, um, this is for sure an eye. So uh, because uh, ImageNet consists of a lot of photographs that people took of their pets, uh, you tend to start, uh, tend to find features that are uh, very distinctive uh, and very very useful to uh, classify uh, household animals. Okay, uh, but this is the kind of features that you will see. Now it is very surprising uh, and I guess reassuring in some sense that the kind of features that have been noticed to uh, form in the visual cortex uh, are quite similar. Uh, to the features that we see here. Okay, so the visual cortex uh, uh, is uh, an area of the brain that is in charge of visual processing. Uh, after the information goes away from uh, goes out from the retina all uh, to the brain, there is many layers of processing that happens uh, uh, by the time it reaches the brain. And so people have given names to this. This is V1, V2, V3 slash V4, etc. And uh, the first stage of processing does tend to learn features that look like this. The second stage of processing will tend to learn more complicated features. So, and then by the time it reaches the brain, it becomes a complete mismatch of features and you cannot interpret it so easily, uh, which is also the case for a neural network. So it is not as if the network will learn this nice looking features always, but if you peek carefully at the features, you will notice that these features do indeed make sense. Okay. So this is this is reassuring because uh, we said that we wanted to mimic how the biological brain is structured, and we used a very very coarse model of how biological neurons are. We said it is a a neuron is a linear function of its in or, or it's 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 a function that looks like this. It has some uh, weights that it multiplies uh, my inputs with. Uh, and uh, and then creates features using some data. So this is you know, real neurons are my, uh, much more complicated than this, but it is nice that we can look at features that do not seem to be very different. Yeah, at least uh, visually. Okay. And uh, now, uh, in, in in some very uh, real sense, uh, the ability to not have to pick features is the real power of deep learning. Uh, if you if you look at how people uh, used to conduct research about uh, 10 years or so ago, uh, someone working in computer vision had a, a completely different knowledge of how their data looks like. Uh, they would know uh, good techniques in image processing. They would know how to combine 3D geometry, ideas from 3D geometry to understand the physical scenes. Uh, all of this was very different from how someone working in natural language processing um, uh, would use their data. They would be interested in representations of words, uh, how sentences are formed using some grammar and stuff from words. Uh, and basically, it was very uh, Im impossible for someone working in computer vision to borrow ideas from NLP and vice versa. Uh, the nice thing that has happened in deep learning, uh, due to deep learning, is that uh, a lot of these fields have uh, begun to use neural networks at such a fundamental level uh, that the uh, that the same kinds of neural architectures uh, and we'll talk a lot a little bit about neural architectures in a bit the same kinds of neural networks uh, that work well for computer vision also indeed tend to work well for NLP and now you can borrow a lot of features and give away a lot of features to other fields. Okay, so uh, the 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 subfields of machine learning tend to come together in spite of the fact that they work on different data modalities or they are interested in asking very different kinds of questions. NLP is interested in understanding the structure of language. Uh, computer vision is interested in understanding the structure of the scene that is underlying your images. Uh, totally different concepts. Um, the, the ways we study these questions today is quite unified. And that helps us make progress in all these fields at a pretty rapid pace. Uh, the most important point for you to remember is that deep networks are universal approximators. We will not do uh, say precisely what this means, but uh, uh, conceptually what it means is that any given data set that you have at your disposal, you can fit a neural network and make uh, in the sense that you can solve this optimization problem and get perfect predictions on that data set. Perfect 
training set predictions. Uh, we are not saying anything about generalization so far. Uh, perfect uh, predictions on the training set. And this is a nice property. So uh, you know that if you have real data that was drawn from a cubic equation and you fit only quadratics, then you wouldn't be able to approximate it uh, ever. Uh, but neural networks are not like this. In some sense, neural networks are a function class that is so rich that uh, it will fit uh, any data set that you have provided that the network is large enough. It has, uh, it has uh, a large enough number of layers and a, la uh, a large enough size of the matrices S1, S2 till SL. Okay. Cool. Uh, any questions perhaps before we begin properly? Yes. I, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I do. I have a question actually. So here you seem to contrast the, uh, uh, the power uh, of deep learning to be used across different fields uh, against uh, the, uh, the com computational complexity of finding such set of features. Uh, mm -hmm. But one might also argue that there are other drawbacks uh, like uh, that except possibly for vision where you can sort of make sense of what the features are. In general, this is the blackest of all black boxes in the sense that you can really hardly understand what is actually happening. You're predicting without understanding. Whereas if you go through the pain of constructing a set of linear features are, as people have been doing over the, in the past years, there you, you sort of get a handle of what, the, how you're explaining things also uh, while predicting them. Is, is that? Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I completely agree. So uh, being able to uh, create the features or creating the features, if we if we created features and they work well, uh, in the sense that they can predict well, then we are in business. Uh, we get a good performance, good predictions, and we also get some notion of uh, interpretation of what these features are or how the probabilistic model is using these features. Uh, not having to create the features is nice uh, because it can give you good predictions, but then you also don't get any understanding of what the features are. These images that you will sometimes see on the internet are very uh, sketchy uh, in the sense that uh, uh, mm, the network, when you train it once, it might learn something that looks like this. Uh, uh, and out of the thousands of features that these networks have, some will look uh, reasonable to you and then many, all the others will basically be stuff that you cannot interpret in any way. So uh, the, uh, the the power to fit anything uh, 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 comes with the downside that you don't understand how this model is being used or how this model learns. Um, in some cases, this trade-off may not be a bad thing to take uh, make. So if you're interested in uh, uh, not in parameter estimation problems. Uh, let's say uh, in, in, in a scientific problem, you're interested in finding one term of a PDE or one or modeling a biological system. In those cases, using black boxes like this is, uh, is, is a little difficult. Uh, but if you're interested in slightly uh, um, uh, less ambitious problems uh, where we are only interested in finding when two images are similar, uh, are only interested in checking when I will uh, tweet next, uh, which is unlikely in the short term, uh, uh, then uh, uh, these models will make sense uh, or, or, or these models are useful. Thank you. I think we have also a question in the chat. Yes. Yeah, so could you please explain once again, figure 4.1, how S is multiplied against different Xs? So, uh, what people will do is that uh, we, we have in our data set uh, uh, different x's. Okay. Uh, after I, I have learned my uh, weights, which is a V star, uh, S1 star, uh, SL star, etc., cetera, uh, I will feed in uh, a lot of my images in the training data set. And I will calculate what I get at the output of each layer. And we'll talk a tiny bit uh, very, very soon what a layer is. But for now, a layer is simply one particular operation applied to the uh, to the images. And this is the second operation being applied to the images. So you can read off the output of sigma times S1 transpose X for many different Xs and check what is it that the feature is trying to select. 
if the output is large, then uh, uh, this is precisely the output. So uh, the inner product uh, between uh, a big vector, if you imagine this matrix strung up as a big vector and an image that also looks like an edge is large. The inner product of this vector with an image that looks like a little more, uh, that, that looks a little bit like a, uh, just a blank color is small. And so that is why people will say this is the kind of feature that is learned by this particular, uh, uh, or th this is this is the kind of pattern that is learned by this particular feature. This is the kind of pattern that is learned by this feature, and that tells you some way of understanding what the feature is. When we look at convolutional networks, this will become much more clear uh, because there uh, the feature is simply the output of one particular op uh, convolutional operator kernel. Okay. So uh, mm, let us look at a little bit of jargon. This is literally just jargon, nothing very deep about uh, why things are defined the way they are, um, or uh, mm, mm, in some cases there is may maybe, uh, and we'll talk about it. So uh, neurons uh, have always been uh, something that are on or off. Uh, mm, so. Uh, depending on how many impulses they get, as how many stimuli they get from neighboring neurons, a neuron might fire or it does not fire. And that was indeed the classical nonlinear function that people use. So this is called the activation function. This is our function sigma. And people, this, these are the first kinds of networks that people used to write. In the 90s, uh, but this one is a little bit, um, uh, or, or this is difficult uh, to use with modern optimization theory because the gradient of this particular nonlinearity is zero. So if you take uh, a neural network that predicts a y hat, you have some function uh, of your true labels y and your predictions y hat. Uh, the derivative of this function, which is the loss that you are fitting, let's say this is the hinge loss, the derivative of that loss with respect to the parameters of your function, which is S in this case, is can be zero uh, essentially always, because uh, this, this nonlinearity is one or zero always, okay? Uh, and that is what makes training these kinds of nonlinearities very hard. So people said, okay, make, maybe you can make it a tiny bit more soft, uh, so this is a sigmoid function. A sigmoid function looks a bit like this. It is uh, zero or it uh, tends to zero as x tends to negative infinity. And then it will uh, plateau out uh, to one uh, on the, uh, uh, as x tends to positive infinity. Yeah. Uh, now the issue with this kind of a network uh, or, or this kind of a nonlinearity is that it plateaus at the end. Mm, this is again like so if your features are something that gives you a value over here for this product s1 times x then pulling back this feature to make it useful such a feature is stuck right it always the neuron always fires we don't like neurons that always fire we don't like neurons that always do not fire we would like the neurons to be active in some time uh, uh, for some images and inactive for some other images so on average, you want the activation of a neuron, which is S uh, sigma times S one X to be in this region. Um, but once the neuron has a large S one, uh, it can have an average activation that is quite a bit larger in the saturation region. And pulling it back requires you to take the gradient of the loss with respect to S. And if the if the nonlinearity saturates, then you cannot do it this easily. Okay. Uh, this is this is why sigmoids are a tiny bit better than thresholds because they are at least differentiable in this region, uh, but uh, they have the same problems as threshold nonlinearities. Is there an understanding on why a sequence of linear and nonlinear operations on X gives uh, uh, predictions that are closer to Y? Yes. So this is this is um, uh, the purview of what is called approximation theory. Uh, and you will see theorems in approximation theory that say that if I have a two-layer neural network, uh, which was uh, uh, precisely this thing, this network uh, can fit any function by it itself. You don't even need a deep network. A two-layer network can fit any function you want, any y, uh, y you want. Uh, so long as uh, the number of feature uh, number of uh, dimensions of W uh, are 
uh, very large. So you can make the network very fat. Uh, 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 and even if it has only two layers, it can fit any function. And so people will study for what kinds of nonlinear operations here uh, is this approximation better achieved. But essentially the thesis is that if the operation is nonlinear, then you can find, uh, you, you can show that the network uh, if, and the network is large enough, then you can show that it can fit any function you want. Uh, okay, uh, that's a that's a, that's a sigmoid. Uh, the issue with the sigmoid is that things don't become negative. Uh, we would like the weights to be both positive and negative, uh, and so uh, people started using functions that are like this. Uh, this is called tanh. Uh, the hyperbolic tangent, which you have seen many times before in uh, physics class. Uh, and this has the same issues as the sigmoid, it also saturates, but at least it is negative in some part of the domain. Uh, another question, for any nonlinear sigma function, this theorem is valid? No, this theorem is not valid for any nonlinear sigma function. It is valid for some kinds of nonlinear sigma functions. And then you will show some conditions on what those, func uh, what those con uh, functions are, okay? Uh, roughly, I think uh, um, the function has to, uh, I cannot seem to remember. So uh, the, the, there is, uh, so one simple way to think about this is that if the weights are allowed to be both positive and negative, then the nonlinearity can be uh, just positive. But for instance, if the weights are positive, then the nonlinearity has to be both positive and negative to approximate any function. So this is one simple case I can think of right now that restricts the kinds of nonlinearities that you uh, use. Okay. So uh, uh, over the years, uh, people have been experimenting with many different kinds of nonlinearities. Uh, and the one that is uh, very popularly used right now is something called as a ReLU. A ReLU is simply a function that looks like this. It is uh, identity uh, uh, um, to the right of the origin, and it is zero to the left of the origin. Uh, this is pretty freaking close to a linear function, uh, but it is clearly a nonlinear function. Uh, it has a huge inhibitory space uh, where uh, everything that we said about the gradients uh, being zero is still holds. So these are all neurons that are inactive. Uh, but the nice part is that on the positive side, the neurons do not saturate anymore. Uh, the nonlinearity allows them to uh, increase in magnitude uh, as much as they want. Uh, this is both a blessing and a curse. Uh, and uh, if you think deeply about it sometime later, you will realize that it is not as rosy. So or it is not as if a ReLU is clearly better than a tan or, uh, or a sigmoid. Uh, but it happens to be that the kind of tricks that we use to train neural networks today, they work well with ReLUs. Okay. Mathematically, it is the maximum of zero and x uh, uh, if x is a scalar argument. Uh, there is many other variants of this. Uh, some people do not like the fact that the ReLU is not differentiable at the origin, uh, so you cannot prove some theorems with it. So they will uh, smooth it a little bit, uh, and then they will use functions that are like this. So x times sigmoid x is uh, a function that essentially looks like a smooth ReLU. Uh, the smoothing happens near the origin because of the sigmoid. Some people will take the negative slope and then make it a tiny bit, uh, or zero slope on the negative side, make it a tiny bit more negative. Uh, doesn't really change anything. They call it leaky or loose. So you will see these things in many networks uh, that people use today in papers and on the internet. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, rectified linear units work great, and all of these will essentially work exactly as well. Uh, um, there is no reason to pick them if you are designing uh, a network for a new problem yourself. Okay, so uh, we have been talking about binary classification problems. Uh, uh, our Y was plus one or minus one. Uh, another cool thing about neural networks is that uh, uh, creating a multi-class classifier is pretty trivial. Uh, our Y hat, was supposed to be some number between plus one and minus one if V is a vector. Uh, but if V is a matrix instead, uh, then Y hat can be thought of as a large vector. So if you have C classes, uh, let's say 10 different digits uh, or 26 let uh, different letters in the alphabet, uh, then V can be a matrix. 
uh, whatever is the dimensionality of this, let us call it P, uh, the number of features. And uh, when you multiply it by this matrix, your output is now a big vector uh, of size uh, C, uh, of, of length C. Okay. Uh, in this case, you can interpret every coordinate of this vector as the probability that an image is that of a cat, an image is that of a dog, an image is that of a giraffe, etc. Uh, and we'll talk about how to use such a, such an interpretation now. But uh, uh, getting a multi-class classifier out of a binary classifier is very easy for neural networks. This is not so for other machine learning models. For instance, uh, you know that uh, if you have a standard uh, support vector machine, it is a very classical model in deep learning to, or, or even a clustering machine that can cluster two things. Uh, Modifying this or adapting this to predict multiple classes requires you to do this entire business of one versus all for all other classes and then combine the predictions using voting, etc. For a neural network, it is much easier. Uh, typical networks will have number of classes that range from uh, 2 to 10 uh, to even uh, uh, hundreds of thousands. Okay. Um, so in a uh, in some sense, like uh, if you're Facebook, uh, uh, each of us uh, might upload an image or, or an Instagram. Uh, they would like to check the similarity between images, and they will use classification machines for doing this. Uh, they will try to guess whether the image came from Pratik or from someone else on this call, uh, and uh, uh, use this as a part of their uh, other pipelines to serve you ads or whatever. Uh, people have given names to different parts of a network. Uh, the all the stuff that comes after you apply a, the matrix S uh, is called a feature. Okay, so uh, S one times X is called the first layer's feature. S two times sigma times S one transpose X is called the second layer's feature. Okay, and this is exactly the features that I drew in the picture above in Figure four point one. This this figure. Okay, uh, people in neuroscience will uh, call uh, the different rows of these matrices neurons, uh, but that is the same name for uh, for that. There's a different name for the same object. Uh, nothing big about it. Uh, in, 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 in what we'll do uh, uh, next, uh, we are not going to worry about the different layers of a network because you cannot say very much about what one layer learns versus what other layer learns. Essentially, it's a big mismatch of uh, a function and it, it, it helps to simply think of this uh, entire neural network as a big complicated function of many, many parameters. Okay, so we are going to forget the fact that there are layers, uh, at least uh, at a notational level, uh, and we'll say that all the weights of my network, uh, the classifier V, or all the matrices that correspond to uh, the, each of these layers, uh, I'll all string them. I'll string them all up as a big vector and call it W. Okay, so this W, I will also say that it has P dimensions. It is Euclidean space uh, in P dimensions. Just like we said, it is uh, our feature space was P dimension. We are going to imagine that our weights are also P dimension. Okay. So at the end of the day, uh, after we abstract away all these things, a neural network is uh, another classifier, uh, which will denote like this, F of X comma W. It takes an input X, makes a prediction Y hat, uh, using the weights W to make that prediction. And we fit this model again using a loss, uh, the average of the loss over all the images in your training set. Uh, and I'll also use this shorthand to denote uh, the loss of the network on the ith image of the training set. Okay. Uh, this is just notation. Now, just like we use the uh, perceptron algorithm or stochastic gradient descent uh, to fit the hinge loss, we would also like to use a stochastic gradient descent to fit a neural network. The uh, for the hinge loss, uh, I could just write down uh, the derivative, uh, which is y times x. Uh, if uh, the perceptron makes a mistake uh, and it is zero otherwise. 
uh, I could I could simply write down this derivative like uh, basic calculus. The uh, net the the function that we have uh, uh, in our hands is a more complicated function of all its parameters. It is not that easy for me to simply write down its derivative. It is possible. It is simply a chain rule at the end of the day. Uh, but it is uh, but people would like uh, some more uh, uh, straightforward ways of writing down this derivative. Okay. Uh, so there is a question that says, how can we choose an activation function for a classification problem? Uh, the simple way to think about this is you do not choose. Uh, you use a ReLU uh, and you do not worry about the activation function. There is other things that you should be worrying about uh, on, a, uh, on uh, your chosen problem. Okay, ReLUs will work. Unless you know something very special about what problem you are solving. For instance, uh, uh, the way ReLUs work uh, is... Uh, it's a it's a it's a piecewise linear function uh, that is being applied to uh, a linear operator, uh, uh, a linear operation on the inputs, right? So if I do this twice now, for instance, what am I going to get? If I'm approximating a function that looks like this, if this is my true function y of x, let us say that x is a, a one dimensional, uh, my ReLUs are going to uh, let me approximate. Uh, uh, this function using a neural network uh, that also learns a piecewise linear output. Okay, so because the nonlinearity is piecewise linear, uh, y hat uh, has to be also piecewise linear. Uh, and so you are really taking a nonlinear function that you wish to fit y of x, um, the outputs for a particular x, and trying to chop it up into little parts that are all piecewise linear. This is reasonable, of course. Uh, uh, for every function. Uh, if you have enough little parts, you can fit any function you want. Uh, but you can get much better answers sometimes if you use uh, different kinds of nonlinearities. For instance, uh, if you knew that your true function y consisted of quadratics only, then you could think of choosing sigma of x uh, to be x square. Uh, and that is also another nonlinear function. Uh, and you use this nonlinear function to approximate your true function. So you could get away with using fewer parameters. You could get a slightly better fit to a problem. Uh, if you knew that your true function was, had some special properties. Uh, this is the, you, there, are, there are examples where I have done this in the past uh, with good effect. Uh, and that makes sense. Usually you don't want to, uh, you, you don't need to do this you know that if the network is large enough, uh, every function can be written down as little pieces uh, of linear functions, and you know that you will get good answers. So that is why you sticking to ReLU is a good idea, uh, unless you know better. Okay, so uh, as I said, uh, you cannot write down the gradient of uh, uh, the loss of a neural network, the, even if it is simply the hinge loss, uh, as easily as we wrote down the gradient for the uh, perceptron. Uh, we would like some more automated ways of calculating the gradient. Why do we want the gradient? Well, we want to use all these ideas from optimization theory to fit the network a little uh, uh, using these al algorithms. And all those methods require the gradient. The gradient is a pretty nice quantity because it tells you and no matter the dimensionality of the weight, the gradient is a large vector that tells you um, that you can converge in so, so and so many iterations. It gives you uh, local information about the loss function. Okay, so backpropagation is an algorithm uh, for computing the gradient of the loss function with respect to weights of a neural network. This is an important sentence to think about. It is also a very simple sentence to think about. Uh, it is nothing other than the chain rule of calculus. It's just implemented a little uh, uh, differently, uh, and that's it. Okay. Uh, to give you an appreciation for how this works, so we will not actually do backpropagation. In my course, I make them do backpropagation. Uh, but here, because uh, we don't have too much time, I'll give you an example. So uh, let's say that we are doing this very silly neural network where the weights and the inputs and the classifiers weights and the outputs are all real numbers, okay? So one dimensional regression uh, between X uh, and Y uh, that is being fitted 
uh, with a function of this kind. So at this very uh, childish level, uh, W are the weights of the first layer. It is just one uh, scalar weight. Uh, all that I've written just W transpose somehow. Uh, v are the weights of the second layer. Again, one scalar weight, okay? When you write this down in, let's say Python, uh, this is the actual graph that Python creates. So you will write down a function that takes in X as an input. Uh, um, it will multi uh, it will use the weights W and it will calculate some intermediate variable Z. Imagine how your computer would do this. Uh, and Z would simply be W transpose X, okay? And we can think of this as the first layer of the network. It will apply the nonlinearity sigma to this intermediate variable and let us say it calculates the feature H, okay? Uh, using this feature, uh, you now up, uh, multiply by the second layer's weights. Uh, this would presumably be layer three to get V times H. Uh, and then you use the true output uh, to calculate the mistake that uh, whether or not you made a mistake. So this would be the loss, okay? So anytime you write down a function like this in your computer, your computer will follow the steps of what is called the forward computation graph. Uh, from the left to the right, okay? Now, we know that chain rule is the opposite of this. Chain rule goes from the right to the left. Uh, what do we want uh, from the chain rule? We want to calculate what is dl by dv and what is dl, uh, uh, oops, what is dl by dv and what is dl by dw okay these are the two derivatives that we want so that we can update w and v in the direction of the negative derivative and uh, fit one and and do one iteration of stochastic gradient descent so just like you would use chain rule to calculate these derivatives back propagation uses the forward computation graph to calculate these derivatives if you simply wrote them down by hand it is obviously a very easy exercise uh, but the interesting thing to note about this exercise is that dl dv uh, is uh, uh, is uh, y minus your prediction y minus your prediction times the uh, uh, derivative of uh, this part which is simply equal to negative sigma times w transpose x uh, when you calculate dl dv you are performing operations that look like this twice Okay, uh, and this is a very important thing to uh, observe. Uh, the, the, the derivative that we see out of the chain rule in calculus uses things that were calculated in the forward graph. So sigma times W transpose X is what? Sigma times W transpose X is precisely H, right? Uh, similarly, uh, the uh, V times uh, sigma times W transpose X uh, is simply V times H. So every term that you will ever see in the chain rule of any function will have little pieces that were created when uh, Python performed the forward computation graph, okay? If you wanted to calculate the backward, uh, the, the chain rule like so, you could imagine remembering all these things, simply caching them while you were performing the forward calculation, and then putting together these cast pieces to get the derivative dl dv. Okay, and this is in 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 a nutshell the purpose or the the way backpropagation works. Backpropagation is simply an algorithm to cache every single intermediate. Uh, variable that you create during uh, uh, the forward propagation um, or when you run this computational graph. And it is a way of taking this cast values and calculating the derivative of the loss with respect to every weight inside the network. Okay. The same thing is true for this also. Uh, you will notice here that uh, when you take the derivative with respect to W, uh, you also have a term which is the derivative of the nonlinearity. Okay, so the way backpropagation works uh, in 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 PyTorch, for instance, uh, is that it is simply a bookkeeping exercise. PyTorch will uh, literally create what is called a tape 
which will record all the operations that are performed on every variable inside the graph. And when it will replay the tape, it will know exactly how to take the chain rule of every single step. Okay. It's a very mechanistic way of taking derivatives. Uh, and, 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 and this is really the crux of why deep learning is seemingly so easy. Uh, the, the central part of uh, deep learning libraries, so there is one library called PyTorch, which I will show you in a bit, uh, is what is called Autograd. Uh, and uh, it is called Autograd because it is a machine for automatic differentiation. Uh, it any any function that you have, uh, it will be able to define a forward graph. The forward graph is trivial to define. It is simply the way you would calculate a function like this. But for every single uh, forward graph, it will able it will be able to automatically write the backward graph and automatically be able to calculate the derivative. This is a huge deal. Uh, in fact, uh, until about ten years uh, ago or so, you would see research papers. Uh, in machine learning where out of eight pages, nine pages for the conference paper, six pages would be spent in deriving the derivative of complicated models. Uh, all of those things are is one line uh, right now, okay, uh, with this automatic differentiation engines. Uh, conceptually, uh, we are interested in not derivatives of an arbitrary function. We are interested in derivatives of uh, the predictions of the network. Uh, which is y hat equal to w transpose v transpose s l transpose etc uh, sigma of s one x okay uh, each of these things uh, is what we'll call a layer uh, a layer is something that performs an operation on its inputs and returns an output so multiplying by s one is a layer. Uh, applying a nonlinear uh, operation to it uh, to a vector is a layer, and there are many such layers in deep learning. Uh, okay, uh, you only write the forward uh, propagation, so you take you tell the um, or you tell the library how the uh, activations of the previous layer and the weights of your current layer are combined to get the activations of the next layer. Okay. Or the, uh, sorry, or get the activations of the current layer. PyTorch will automatically fill in this function called backward, which will say, how does the derivative of the loss with respect to the output of this layer, the weights of this layer, and the activations that this layer created during the forward pass come together to give us the derivative of the loss with respect to the weights of this layer and the derivative of the loss with respect to the activations of the previous layer okay once you have the active derivative of the loss with respect to activations of the previous layer when you call backward on the one layer before this you will be able to again uh, um, back propagate the gradient so when people say we are doing back propagation of the gradient what they really mean is uh, they are using quantities like this dl dy hat to calculate dl uh, dv. Uh, they are using quantities like dl, uh, ds, uh, k, uh, hk, uh, which is the activations of this, to calculate quantities like uh, dl, uh, dsk minus one. Mm, actually, sorry. dl dhk and sk so the weights of my layer the derivative of the loss with respect to my output are being used to calculate how the previous layers output uh, define uh, uh, how how much the loss is sensitive to the previous layers output okay and and you will see that this is a pretty mechanistic process uh, you will never ever do it by hand uh, usually uh, although it is useful to do it uh, uh, in the beginning for pedantic reasons um, but this is the reason why Py, uh, deep learning seems so easy because you don't have to take uh, any derivatives anymore. Okay. Questions? No, no questions here in the whole. Yes. Okay, cool. 
So uh, next, uh, so now we know the little bits and pieces of what makes a typical neural network. We are going to specialize this networks to handle certain kinds of data. Uh, and we are going to look at convolutional neural networks. Uh, the problem with neural networks that consist of matrices, multiplying vectors is that we cannot use them for images. Oops. We cannot use them for images very easily. Uh, mostly because images are very large things. Uh, so a typical 100 plus 100 image, RGB, has uh, 10,000 times 3, 30,000 dimensions right there. Okay. So if you have uh, 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 even a one layer neural network uh, that takes in 30,000 uh, dimensional inputs and simply creates a 10 dimensional output. This would be a perceptron that has 10 classes instead of two classes that takes in this dimension data that itself is a 300,000 parameter model. Uh, so uh, networks with matrices S1, S2, etc. are very parameter hungry. Uh, they are big things to calculate. Okay. Um, the uh, uh, just to give an appreciation for how bad things are, uh, I talked about a hundred cross hundred image. Uh, typical phones right now. So the iPhone four or the Pixel seven. Uh, do people know the resolution of the camera for these phones? It is uh, 50 megapixel. Uh, that is uh, 50 times 10 raised to 6 pixels times 3 RGB. Uh, so that is roughly uh, 10 raised to 8 dimensions right there at the input. Uh, you have to kill all this dimensionality very quickly uh, in order to do computations with it. Okay? And this is the central problem in computer vision. Images are large. Images are highly redundant observations of the physical scene. And if you want to understand the scene, if you want to understand how many objects there are, what they are doing, etc., we need some way of killing away all these variations in the images. Okay. And here, <clears throat> here is how variations of images look like. So this is the uh, office of my advisor, uh, my PSD advisor. Uh, and let's say that you took an image of the uh, um, in his uh, a photograph in his office early in the morning. Uh, uh, the same exact office would look a little bit different. The image would look quite different if uh, you we took the image at night with a different uh, lamp. Okay. If I just moved around a little bit in the office, all of you will agree that this is the same physical office, but I simply have taken a photograph from a slightly different place. Okay, um, this is exactly the same office again, except that I moved the potted plant in between me and the camera. And now obviously the photograph looks totally different. So these are all things that make images different. The first one is illumination. The second one is viewpoint. The third one is visibility or occlusions. The exact same scene, which uh, I'll denote by psi here, uh, can look very different in different images, depending on what uh, what parameters or what operations uh, were performed before we created the image of the scene. Okay, for the purposes of understanding this scene, uh, these operations are not very useful. I want to know whether there is a computer monitor on his desk. Uh, the fact that the room is illuminated or where I'm looking at the image from, uh, where I'm looking at the desk from is immaterial to me answering this question, right? So uh, statisticians will call such quantities nuisances. They're nuisances because they don't let us say anything about the true thing that we want to say something about, the scene side, okay? The physical uh, scene side. Uh, but they play a role in how images are created. They play a role in how observations of the scene are created. And so we need some way of mitigating the variability of uh, or caused by all these nuisances if we are to ever understand the scene side. Okay. So this is the name of the game in uh, uh, computer vision specifically, but machine learning in general. Data is always created using uh, from some uh, concept, uh, whether it is uh, the, the sentiment that you're trying to express when you write down a sentence, 
uh, or uh, the uh, the physical scene that you have in a uh, when you take photographs uh, corrupted by nuisances in vision they would have some nice uh, structure viewpoint is a nuisance which has a group structure illumination and visibility do not have a group structure but uh, we know their names uh, in in language they will be a little more diverse even uh, the same sentiment that you're trying to express, you can express it in many different ways. Different people here would write totally different sentences for saying, I am happy. Uh, and, and that is exactly the nuisance variability that we want to average away if you want to understand the concept that people are trying to express. In some cases, the entire concept may be totally different. So this is an image of a office. It is actually my office when I was a student. Um, uh, uh, during my master's, so this is this is an office in UCLA. This is an office in MIT. Totally different offices. Obviously, the images look totally different. And if you are, if we are to say that this image and this image are different things, and this is very trite at this particular point for this particular example, but hopefully you get the point. If you want to understand the differences between the scene side. We need some way of killing the variability introduced by uh, the nuisances. Okay. Certain nuisances are easy and certain other nuisances are harder. So, in this chapter, uh, we are going to take a look at one particular kind of nuisance, which is simply translation. Okay. Translation is a group nuisance in the sense that if I, uh, there is a, uh, there is, it follows the definition of a group, it has an identity element, I can revert it by multiplying it by the, uh, uh, by the negative of the movement that I perform when I click one image. Uh, and so, uh, for such kinds of nuisances, uh, there are operations that we can perform within the network that automatically makes the network uh, uh insensitive to such operations in the data okay uh we know one answer to this uh, uh convolution is a uh, uh, is an operation uh, that is uh, equivariant uh, for translations and the way i will explain it is as follows so uh the basic building block of the network before was a vector w multiplying the inputs x uh, the basic building block in this case uh, for a convolution net neural network is going to be a vector W being convolved with a vector X. Okay. Uh, I don't need to tell you the definition of a convolution, um, but uh, maybe just to be a tiny bit more pedantic, if X is a vector, you pad it uh, on both the left hand side and the right hand side by infinity. Uh, and you perform the convolution summation or the convolution integral. It's an infinite sum. Uh, it is going to take the signal and then at each point it will multiply it by the weights, uh, the mirror flip of the weights and then sum it up. Okay. Uh, so in pictures, it will look a little bit like this. If this is my X, this is my W. I first uh, 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 take my X, uh, flip uh, the W because uh, the convolution uh, tells me to flip the W. Uh, across uh, the uh, y axis. Uh, and then at each uh, little uh, point, I will sum up these two or take the inner product of these big vectors and then sweep the kernel from the left to the right, which is given by this integral over here. Okay. So an input of length three uh, with zeros padded to the left and right, a convolution kernel of length uh, three, uh, zeros padded to the left and right is giving me an output of length five okay now there is various ways of thinking about this people will sometimes drop the borders and say no no i want only an output of length three or some people will keep the borders depends on the application for neural networks we choose where what we want to do uh, but the uh, one thing to note here is that the kernel uh, that uh, i am using when i say i'm performing a convolution has nothing to do with the kernel that we saw in the previous lecture. Uh, it just happens to be the same word. Uh, signal processing people call filters and kernels interchangeably, uh, but uh, these two things, the, the two kernels are totally different and there is nothing connecting them. Okay. Uh, in typical deep learning libraries, uh, uh, they implement a slightly different operation. Uh, they do not flip the kernel before performing the summation, uh, before performing the inner product. So technically speaking, uh, this is something called as a cross-correlation operation. 
where uh, you are running this particular summation x tau as tau goes from negative infinity to infinity wk plus tau instead of wk minus tau okay uh this is a clever uh trick uh because we are going to learn all the features w anyway in the network just like we are learning these matrices s or learning the classifier v even for a convolutional neural network we are going to learn the kernel uh, that performs the convolution in the network so whether we learn the actual kernel and flip it before performing the convolution or whether we learn the flipped version to begin with and perform a cross correlation operation it doesn't matter very much and this is why the deep learning libraries implement a cross correlation operation and still call it a convolution operation okay uh two dimensional convolutions work the same way you slide the kernel across the uh, a 2d image uh, from the left to the right and from the top to the bottom and depending on uh what the weights of your kernel are you can perform different operations so this you know uh, mm, uh, pretty surely uh if the kernel is large at the center and then it has uh, let's say these four ones uh on the four axes when you sweep this kernel over an image like this, this is an image of uh, Jeff Hinton, uh, you will get a slightly blurrier image. Hopefully Zoom shows uh, uh, that the image on the right-hand side is a tiny bit more blurry, uh, but uh, you will notice that the edges have been smeared out a little bit because you're averaging in the local neighborhood. On the other hand, if you average with negative weights in the kernel, then you will get a slightly sharper image because this is now checking whether the local intensity at a pixel is higher than all its neighbors or not. And then summing up with these specific weights to create the sharpened image. Uh, you can also detect edges. Uh, edge filter will look a little bit like this. Uh, it, is, it is going to detect horizontal edges uh, in this direction. And this is something called as a Sobel filter. Uh, and there is, of course, like uh, you can do an entire class on signal processing studying these kinds of operations. Uh, uh, the point to understand about all this is that uh, we could have created such features by hand uh, if we were dealing with images. And this is indeed what we would do 10, 15 years ago. Uh, the ability to learn these weights uh, allows us to create features without having to choose them by hand. Okay, so just like uh, in a deep neural network, we take these matrices S1, transpose X, uh, and then stack them up uh, on top of each other. We can perform the exact same thing for a convolutional neural network. We can replace the uh, first layer uh by something like this so let me let me call it uh, s1 convolved with x as my first layer for, for a second simply imagine that s1 is a, a matrix where every row of the matrix i think of it as a big kernel uh and then the row and this particular uh, vector x are being convolved together i can now convolve it with another uh, such thing and apply anonymity and do the same stacking business uh, to get predictions out. This is a convolutional neural network. Now, the cool thing about this is that if you are doing a dense neural network, then you would need lots and lots of weights to even uh, take all the pixels to the output. So uh, if you have 10 to the four pixels, 1000 outputs that you want out of your network, then Right there, you have 10 raised to uh, six or uh, 10 raised to seven parameters, uh, 10 million parameters. For a convolutional neural network, you can get outputs for the entire image, even if your kernel is very small. So, in some sense, a convolutional network is a subset of the neural network that we saw in the previous chapter. Uh, any uh, convolutional net network can be represented by a fully connected network or what is called a dense network the ones with s's uh, are called dense neural networks uh, and that simply corresponds to one particular way of selecting s1s and s2s you know that convolution is a linear operator uh, so when i convolve a vector with another vector i can write this as some matrix s times x uh, this is called a toplitz matrix or a circulant matrix for 2d images 
so there exists a dense neural network that is equivalent to a convolutional neural network, but the convolutional neural network has very few parameters, whereas this matrix S would be very large and I wouldn't know what to pick it as. Okay. And so that is what allows us to build very large networks uh, uh, that uh, in particular work on images. Now, this doesn't mean that neural networks are small. Uh, people will take the convolutional neural networks and do so many convolutions and so many layers and stuff that it still ends up becoming a very large network. Uh, but we'll get there in a bit. Uh, now, uh, one thing that I will note is that you will often see an operation that is called padding. Uh, padding is uh, the convolution integral uh, uh, tells us to move the image uh, uh, at each location. Okay, uh, to to move the image after every uh, uh, unit interval uh, on the real line, uh, but you don't have to move this. You can do this summation on, uh, with with uh, gaps in between, and this is what is called a stride. Uh, and so uh, you can, by using a stride, the result of the output will be a tiny bit smaller than the dimensionality of X. And that is a nice thing because uh, uh, this lets, uh, lets you remove some of the small scale way, uh, uh, redundant structure that you can see in images. Uh, everything that you see in images is locally the same. So the color on my shirt is locally the same. You don't need to know the feature for every particular pixel on my shirt to classify a shirt. You are happy to simply take a patch that detects the color blue and then uh, moves it with some gaps in between to create the convolution instead of uh, moving it every uh, pixel. This is something called a stride. It is a very powerful way of uh, reducing the size of images as the images go up in your network in different layers. So your 50 megapixel image, uh, uh, you can reduce it uh, 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 right there uh, to 12 megapixels using a stride of two, because you will lose uh, 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 four, uh, the, the, uh, the size of the image will be four times smaller with the size of stride of two. Questions? I'm not here. Um, okay, thank you. So uh, now let us see how the network is engineered. Uh, 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 a, a typical network is engineered. So images uh, I, uh, usually have uh, three channels. Uh, the images that you and I take usually have three channels. Uh, the R channel, the G channel, and the B channel, red, green, and blue. A typical convolution network we'll have three different kinds of kernels that run on each channel independently, okay? So each layer, each convolutional layer in the network will have a red kernel, a green kernel, and a blue kernel. After performing the convolution of this kernel with an image like this, you get an output. In this particular case, I chose the padding of the signal and the stride to be so that uh, I took an image that was one, two, three, four, five cross five, and I got an input uh, output that was size three cross three. Uh, and there is very many ways of getting different kinds of images, but let's say we get three cross three images. Given the output of the convolution like this, a typical layer in a convolutional neural network will uh, sum them up. So it will sum up the output of the convolution on each of the different channels. It will add a bias to this, just like we added a bias for the perceptron, W transpose X plus B. Uh, so this is the W transpose X part. It has been replaced by W convolved with X part, uh, convolution happening for every channel independently. And then this is the bias, okay? And you get one particular channel of the output uh, of that particular layer. Now, the way to think about this is I have an image, let us say it is W cross uh, 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 of size, width cross height cross uh, uh, channels, okay? Oops. This image, uh, um, I can think of it as a three dimensional array. Uh, it goes in into a network uh, or it, it goes into a convolutional layer. 
and out comes an image uh, of uh, another size c prime w prime h prime again don't get confused by w's and h's here they just simply denote widths and heights uh, every particular channel of the output uh, is created by combining the convolution of all channels of the input so when we perform a convolution operation uh, we are mixing and merging the information that consists in different channels of the input uh, activations to that particular layer. Uh, so roughly speaking, the number of, uh, not roughly speaking, so uh, the number of convolutions that you perform in a layer that takes in uh, three channel images, let's say that three C is equal to three and returns three channel images. Uh, let's say that W prime and H prime are the same size is nine different convolutions. For every one of the output channels, you have different filters uh, that work for every one of the input channels, okay? That is why convolution networks can get pretty large. You can imagine that uh, if this was uh, 10 channels and the 10 is actually a small number, typical networks will have hundreds of channels. Uh, then you have all these kernels. Uh, in this case, you will have 30 kernels. If the size of each kernel is five plus five, then each kernel has 25 weights. And now it is 25 times 30 weights plus the biases. Uh, and there is 10 such biases, one for every channel, okay? One for every output channel, okay? So even if the number of weights in a convolution layer is much smaller than the number of weights for a fully connected layer or a dense layer, it can get large pretty quickly. It is very useful to think about uh, how the conversions are implemented because that uh, will help you get better results out of this. Uh, many people forget the fact that these channels are merged together uh, uh, um, when they implement a network. Now, the reason we use convolutions, as I said, is to obtain what is called translational equivariance. Uh, and that uh, is a fancy word for a very simple concept. Uh, it simply says that if I had a kernel that could detect a star like this, I would also like to detect a star if the star moved in the image, right? So I have a filter that is uh, the output of this filter or a kernel is large when the stuff in, uh, within it or in its receptive field is a star. I would also make, like to make sure that this other output is large at this location if the star is at this location. Now, the issue with this is that even if the output of the convolutional layer is large here and large here. So even if the filter of the convolutional layer was perfect, it was exactly a star detector, then we wouldn't know how to detect the star because for this particular image, these pixels are large. For this image, these pixels are large. So equivariance is the name given to a property that when I move up, uh, apply some operation on the input image, in this case, translating uh, the image, the same operation is applied to the output uh, features of that particular uh, layer. Okay, uh, If I uh, translate the star, then the features corresponding to the star, uh, which, I, uh, which I have by running a star filter on it, uh, also translate by the same amount. This mathematically is called equivariance. Uh, you can write it down like this. The, uh, the kth element of the condition of x, comma, uh, x and w is equal to uh, the k plus delta element of the convolution of x prime and w if x prime is the transformed image. Actually, uh, more precisely this. Yeah. Cool. So uh, this is equivalence. Uh, while this is useful for us to be able to detect an object at different parts of the image, it is not very useful to us to understand, uh, to be able to classify the object. Why? Because at the end of the day, we are going to build a network that takes in whatever features I have uh, and then takes an inner product with some weights, the weights of a classifier, and then apply the sign function to do this, right? Just because the features move, uh, just because the features move from this location to this other location, uh, imagine that the you string this image up as a big vector. 
so the image, uh, this it was non-zero over here. In the second example, it is non-zero somewhere else. Just because I multiply by this uh, vector v doesn't mean that I have the same output. I would like the output of the model to be the same because at the end of the day, the model is detecting a star. If there was a star in this image, uh, in this image, there is also a star in this image. So when the features move, we would like the output of the model to not move, but we would like the features of the model to move. We want equivariance of the features, but invariance of the output of the model. And this is a pretty difficult property to get because uh, at one point you want sensitivity to changes in the input images. That is what convolutions are buying us, uh, sensitivity to translations. Uh, but you want to be insensitive in how the output of the model is. Okay. So typical deep networks make a specific choice in creating such invariants. They will use an operation that is called pooling. Uh, you can imagine that if you had uh, um, taken a simple operation uh, that looks like this, so can find me the maximum of uh, the uh, pixels uh, in the features uh, of, of these features in the entire image, then the maximum would be the same in both these cases. If there was a star in both these images, the maximum would be, let's say, one. If there was no star, the maximum would be something smaller than one. So. Mm, if we were doing some kind of uh, uh, maximization operation or selection operation, then we would get such invariance uh, out of even if the features were actually varying with image transformations applied to the images. And that is exactly the idea that people in deep learning use. They will perform an operation that is called max pooling. Uh, max pooling is simply uh, an operation that takes in an image that looks a little bit like this. I simply gave names to the, uh, I simply wrote numbers in the different cells. A max pooling over a window of size two cross two is going to uh, take the maximum locally of pixels uh, in that window, okay? And then after moving from this window, it will move to uh, the next window with a stride of uh, two in this case, okay? So, the, re the way max pooling creates invariance is that it doesn't create invariance completely, but it creates insensitivity. If the maximum of the pixels in this is six, the other pixels can be left, can take very uh, slightly different values and the maximum would still be six. So long as the other pixels are not larger than six, any of them, uh, uh, we have created uh, a tiny bit of invariance in how the output of this layer is created from the lower layer, okay? So typical neural networks will have a structure where they will perform, a, a, let's say one layer of convolutional features. Uh, this is my image X. Uh, then they will perform a nonlinear operation, which is uh, which is ReLU or something. And then they will perform a max pooling operation, okay? Uh, so, what was made sensitive by the convolutional layer is made insensitive by the max pooling layer. And you know that if you perform max pooling many, many times, it would take a large image of size 100 plus 100 and then keep pooling it all the way down to one pixel. Then it is, of course, very, very sensitive, uh, very, 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 very in insensitive to changes in the input image. So while uh, convolutional neural networks do not exactly uh, get invariance, they get uh, little bits of invariance after every operation of the max pooling operator as uh, you go higher up in the different layers, okay? So a typical uh, neural network will have a structure like this. It will uh, have a couple of layers, uh, let's say uh, nonlinearities, uh, and then maybe another max pooling layer. Mm, and then at the top, uh, you will simply not worry about the fact that these are uh, slightly sensitive pixels and then combine them anyway, okay? And in that case, you may get some smeared out behaviors uh, when you collapse features like this, but that is good enough to detect large objects in images. And that is what people use. Uh, any questions? Okay. So I think I have about five minutes or so, right?
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let us now look at the other kinds of nuisances. So convolutions, of course, are a beautiful operation, but they only let us address one nuisance, right? Translations, not even the entire viewpoint, which is rotations and translations and three-dimensional rotations and translations. Uh, uh, the other kinds of nuisances like contrast or illumination or occlusions, we cannot uh, get rid of by such elegant operations. Uh, and that is why people use something called as data augmentation. This is uh, a word given to a very, very simple operation. Uh, it is called, uh, so fast, uh, let, let me show you some operations. Uh, um, so a cat is a cat. If I rotate it, if I skew it a little bit, uh, if I zoom towards its face, etc. And uh, these are all nuisances that uh, inform how images of cat are created from the object cat. And in order to force the network to be insensitive to these nuisances, in order to force the network to average out this variability, we will create a data set which augments uh, uh, a typical image of a cat or an image of a cat that you have in your data set with such operations. So you will typically perform image processing uh, operations uh, that involve, uh, in this case, uh, uh, reflection. Uh, in this one would be, uh, this is uh, the top left or here is uh, a zoomed in version of the same image and then cropped at a different location. The top right is a different zoom and a crop. So these are different images, but presumably both of them are a cat. Uh, and this forces the network to not pay attention to all features, but use specific features to make predictions of the cat being a cat. Actually, I said the exact opposite. Forces the network to pay attention to all features and not use specific features to call a cat a cat. Uh, uh, there is many operations that people have discovered to work well, um, mostly because typical images have this variability. Uh, so in this case, this is about uh, brightness. Uh, you can think of contrast changes, uh, you can think of different crops, uh, um, and you can think of affine operations that are applied to the image. Uh, blurring is another one. Depending on the application, uh, the kinds of augmentations that we use in deep learning or uh, vision or even images have, uh, or even text has its own different kinds of operations is very different. And in, in a lot of ways, this is the real crux where your knowledge, a uh, part where your knowledge of the problem uh, plays a role. Uh, uh, to give you a few simple examples, uh, if you had images of a house, uh, the uh, difference between the left-hand side image and the middle image is that I flip them in a mirror, right? Uh, both of them are perfectly plausible images of a typical house. Uh, the third image uh, in the third column, I flipped it uh, using a water reflection. And this is not a plausible image of a house. It is an upside down house, which you will only see in uh, Alice in Wonderland or something. Uh, so. The, we shouldn't use augmentations that make the house look upside down if our objective is to classify houses or detect houses. Why? Because at test time, we are unlikely to see images like this. So we should only use augmentations that we think will look uh, like the test images. And this is really where our knowledge of the problem comes into play. Uh, if you want to classify cows, uh, let's say you have images uh, of a cow uh, on a field of grass. These are typical images of a cow. These are slightly more unusual images of cows, cows on beaches. Uh, you would like to collect such images. Of course, if you're only running the classifier in Switzerland, uh, then you can be happy with this particular picture, right? You will never see a cow on a beach. Uh, so you don't need to collect images of cows on beaches. On the other hand, if you were running the classifier in India, you want to collect images of a cow on a street next to people. So the kinds of images that we use to train machine learning models necessarily has to in, be informed by the kind of images we will see at test time. 
Augmentation is one specific example where we get to apply certain operations, image processing operations on the images that uh, allow us to uh, express the idea that these are the images that I'll see at test time. Okay. If we make mistakes in augmenting too much, then we are imposing too many constraints on the network. The network is now forced to also classify this image, which wastes its learning capacity. And we'll talk about it in the next lecture. If you apply too few augmentations, then you don't average out the nuisances and you remain sensitive to the nuisances that you did not uh, impose using augmentations. Okay. So augmentation is a blanket all operation that catches things that are left over after convolution. You don't need to augment images using translation because convolutions already take care of it. Yep. Uh, I land here and then we'll begin in the next lecture with some loss functions and some more uh, mathematical material. Any questions? Thank you, thank you, Pratik. Uh, mm -hmm. Any questions from the audience? No, okay. Uh, I don't see any question in chat either. So thank you again. We will uh, recommend tomorrow, same time for the last Thank lecture. you. Yeah, see you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.